Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Dave Franzen, Extension Soil Fertility Specialist from NDSU. Dave Franzen is a professor of soil science and extension soil specialist at North Dakota State University. He received his BS, MS, and PhD at the University of Illinois and worked for 18 years as an agronomist manager for a chain of fertilized retail locations in Illinois before coming to NDSU in June of 94. His research is focused on strategies for site-specific nutrient application and nutrient rate studies to serve as a foundation for crop nutrient recommendation revisions. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, this, is a, this is as far west as I've been in South Dakota to speak. And I haven't been here for a very long time. But uh, last time I think I was about this way, there was signs for six foot prairie dog ranch store. When did that, when did that die finally? 20 years ago? I don't know. It's still there? Is it really? Oh my God, no, I don't, I don't think it is. No, my sister wanted to know because she still remembers that. She lives in Florida. All right, so history of phosphate exports. So you didn't know you had a mine here, did you? Didn't know you had a mine. You, you thought the phosphate came from Idaho or, or Florida, but, uh, but, but here we go. So the, the way this thing evolved is that I got a phone call about eight years ago, and it was somebody from the Governor's Historical Society of North Dakota, and they wanted me to give a presentation out of Bismarck on the history of fertilizer application in North Dakota. And so I heard the word governor, and I said yes, and then I hung up the phone, and I thought, what the heck am I gonna talk about for 45 minutes? I'm gonna show a chart of NPK since 1950, and it'll take all of five minutes. So then I started thinking on a, a little bit more about things that I've heard and talking to farmers, and especially older farmers and that, and so, so it kind of developed from there. To, to give you background, is that the soils in this region, and our former speaker showed the ones in, in Colorado, but this whole area, this whole Great Plains was a really remarkable area that had been it had been prairie and a graze system for, you know, in, in this area, more than 10,000 years. Uh, we have relatively fragile soils out here. The sediments are way older than they are east of the, east of the river. Uh, but, uh, but the prairies have been around for a long time. And they've built up all of that organic material to very deep depths in most of our soils really high levels of nitrogen and phosphate, all the, all the nutrients that, that a plant could need uh, were in those soils uh, when our settlers, when our grandfathers and great-grandfathers came to this area. A lot of the people that came west were, were not really well off. And, and one of the things they saw is their going across the paths to wherever their homestead was, was, was there, were, there were bones everywhere that, you know, we, we think of the, the natives that lived here before, uh, that uh, you hear the stories that they used all, all the parts of the buffalo, and that's true, but they didn't use all the parts to all the buffalo. I mean, how many scapular could, it, could, it, could it, a family really use? You know, once you got a shoulder blade to use as a shovel, do you really need Twenty, you know. So, so there is all these bones all over the place. You know, they're they're buffalo bones mostly, but you know, deer, elk, whatever, you name it, it's all in there. So, so there was a cottage, you know, more than the cottage industry. It was a big, a big industry at one time. The the first states that took advantage of this were, were Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, uh, states to the south of us. But the settlers would pick up buffalo bones and they'd put them on a rail car and they'd ship them east, and we, we think that, that uh, maybe they used some for fertilizer, but I'll show you, you know, they used them for other things too. So, and, and sometimes there's some big bucks uh, in it. This is up by Devil's Lake uh, in the 1880s, big piles waiting for, the, waiting for the trains to come by. This is in the Red River Valley. Those are the Metis Indians that had the Red River carts full of bones that they're picking up and taking to the, either to the uh, the river boats on the river or the rail on the northern Pacific that uh, just came through 
uh, Fargo. So, um, let me see, back around 1980, roughly, uh, was Centennials for a lot of uh, North Dakota little towns, and probably yours, yours too. So, uh, in some of those, some of those towns, there was enough of a push and enough of a history that that they would would interview people that were old enough to remember things, and and then they would put them out into these um, uh, little booklets, you know, 100 year anniversary of Ellendale or Edgeley or someplace, and you know, then they have quotes from different people. And so these, you can pick these up on the internet, and maybe if your little town has um, one of these things, you can go back and read some of this yourself. Uh, but this is in uh, the first paragraph there is from Cullum, uh, North Dakota, which is in Dunn County, northwest of Bismarck. It says, first several years were especially hard due to crop failures and low prices. Buffalo bones were picked up and hauled to Ellendale in exchange for food and flour. Ellendale was the nearest town at the time, and 42 miles from the farm. So, um, I was wrong. I was thinking of somebody else. But anyway, Cullum is near Ellendale, 40 miles away. Then the next one is Mr. Kruger broke up about uh, 10 acres of land the first year, but 1889 was a drought year and he didn't get his seed back. Mr. Kruger, having nothing else to do after seeding, started picking up buffalo bones. He sold them in Edgeley and Ellendale for 12, 12 bucks a ton, which is really, you know, pretty big money back then. He'd go out one day, come home the next with a wagon load of bones, camping out overnight, and sold about $70 worth of bones during that early part of the summer in 1889 and it helped them quite a bit as they had no other income. And then their lair, uh, North Dakota, which is in kind of east, uh, southeast North Dakota. They planted their first phylax crop, collected buffalo bones, received about $2 a wagon load. So many, many stories like this across the, across the area. Uh, these are some uh, Buffalo Bones near Krim, that's what I was thinking about, eight miles northeast of Hazen, uh, with the piles of bones there. You can see the wagon where they brought them in, the rail cars, and they load them all by hand, and, and hand labor was about it. So you see pictures from all over the place. There's a pile of bones up there in the top. Uh, you know, you can see pictures from Canada. Uh, there's one down uh, in North Dakota. These are some in uh, Saskatchewan. That big line of skulls over there is from Saskatchewan. And uh, some bones being picked up on a train car in Ellendale in 1888. So, you know, they, they use them for fertilizer in the east, but, but this comes from, I got this picture from the Detroit Library, and it's the Michigan Carbon Works uh, in Rougeville, Michigan. And it's this big pyramid of, of skulls. Is it, does that look familiar? Ever see Revenant? Where do you think they got the idea for that? Anyway, that's a movie that was out here a while back. But anyway, so carbon works. I don't know what they made there, but you know, they used buffalo bones to do it. So a typical bone meal, you go to the store, go to, go to the organic section or whatever, and, and you have bone meal that's about 315-0, about 15% P205. And, uh, and so, uh, a lot of the nitrogen that came from the bones probably probably went back in the soil, but, but the phosphate, of course, was picked up and, and moved away. In Kansas, they still have the records uh, for that in this uh, publication that I, that I looked at, and, and their big time period was 72, 74, where ours was somewhere around 87 to, to maybe 91, 92, something like that, although people still picked up buffalo bones in North Dakota up into the 20s, you know, really. but. Uh, they shipped about 3.2 million tons of bones from Kansas to the east. And in North Dakota, uh, Northern Pacific records were destroyed by fire, but it's pretty reasonable to assume that, that about the same amount of, of tons was, was used. So uh, if you figure that about 3.2 million tons of bones were shipped, they contain 15% phosphate, then about 480 tons of P205 was shipped out of North Dakota and probably similar amounts out of South Dakota. Uh, and that's about two years of phosphate use at today's present higher rates. If you looked at the trends of phosphate use over time, you were kind of at the peak. You know, probably peaked out when, you know, those marvelous years when corn was seven and soybeans were 15. Um, but um, it's slacked off a little bit since then. But anyway, we're very high rates, about two years. So that's, that, was, that was cool. 
So I, so I got done with all that research and put some slides together and I thought, well, now I've got 15 minutes. Now what am I going to do about the other half hour? You know, and I sat and I thought and I thought and I thought. Well, I'd been around not quite 20 years at the time. Uh, and you know, most of those years have been pretty wet, but you know, I've seen my share of dust storms, especially in the Red River Valley where people don't get it yet. And, but, um, and I've been around no-till people and, and had plots all over the area, uh, all over the state, and worked with no-tillers and that. And then, but I never really heard anybody talk about how much was really lost. And so I started to dig in. <laughs> And the more I dug, the more appalled I was, and the more amazed I was at, at the losses that we've experienced since that plow first turned what the natives said, you know, you turn the, turn the grass upside down. You know, what happened during that time? And, and what I found was, was really our great phosphate export business has been going on since that plow first came out, and it comes in the form of, of losing all the topsoil because it's just been devastating. I mean, you guys struggle with it every year, um, unfortunately. This is up, you know, in the Williston area back in the 30s. So, I mean, why did that happen? I mean, our, you know, our, our ancestors were not stupid people, so what in the world? So, so they, came from, they came from Scandinavia, and they came from Germany, and they kind of came from Czechoslovakia and different places in Europe, and they came from the eastern United States, and all of those places, uh, stiff wind is probably 10 miles an hour. And the technology of the time it was to run back and forth and back and forth. This is probably like the fifth time that that person in that tractor has gone across that piece of ground to get the, to get the land to the consistency of flour. Sometime, and some of you that are older, you know, know this right away, but some of you that are younger really, you know, haven't grasped it. But go into an old, old fence row sometime and, and, and look at one of those discs that they, that they had, or one of the planters, I mean. Look at one of those planters. I mean, there's hardly any down pressure on them at all. You know, the openers are just, you know, one step above what the Egyptians used 4,000 years ago. There's a reason we call them drain grills. And so, you know, that it had to be flour in order for them to get in the ground and, and put the seed in the ground because it, it just wasn't heavy it, and, and things you pulled it with weren't heavy. And uh, not like the kind of equipment we had today. Uh, so this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to work your ground out to the consistency of flour so that you could get a good stand. And then, just as a little aside, but it's certainly related to this, there was some joker called Campbell that came out about uh, 1900, roughly. And his idea for the Great Plains was to make sure that you pul pulverize the soil enough so that when the wind started blowing, you would create dust, dust mulch so that your soil didn't dry out so much. And you know, he had pictures from Colorado, and he had pictures from Kansas, and he had pictures from North Dakota. I mean, this was, this was like the Bible for farmers in 1900. So you can Google it. You could probably find it online. Campbell Dust Mulch. I know you can find it. Anyway, th this guy, I mean, it's too bad the Women's Temperance Union Union wasn't active at that period of time, and that would have prevented a lot of problems, I think. Anyway, uh, another thing is on these prairies, there's not a tree in sight, right? I mean, so once the wind blows, and you know the wind blows, once the wind blows, you got all this, you know, it's just free to go. It's just gone. So people think that this started in the 30s, but it didn't start in the 30s. Um, I came up. North of Fargo, about 30 miles or so, a little town of Hillsboro, uh, there used to be about a two to 3,000 acre uh, red clover seed farm. You know, alfalfa really hadn't come into the area yet, and red clover was the thing. And so uh, these, these people, you know, I found their brochure, their sales brochure, and, and people didn't write just, you know, they, they didn't have just uh, little tagged uh, lines like we do in the ads today. I mean, they just told this whole story about their farm. 
And, and just in passing, the person said, um, every time it blows a little bit, the ditches fill up with black soil, black soil and we, we have to come and, and clean them out. And then he went in and talked about something else. But, but this is just in passing. It was just like, you know, it's, it's just kind of a pain. Uh, but the soils are just so deep, you know, you didn't care if you lost anything. You just didn't, it didn't matter at all for a long time. So anyway, then it got dry in the late 20s. Uh, that's corn up by Minot, why somebody would grow corn up on Minot. Uh, you know, back in 29, I have no idea, but anyway, it was a bad idea that year. And so successive dry years and um, you know, couldn't grow anything, work in the field four or five times, and you can imagine. So my, my, the person that has the office right next to me, Tom DeSutter, he's an excellent researcher, great teacher, just got an award this last year from NDSU. But he does volunteer work out in the community, he does volunteer hospice, which I think is you know, pretty heavy stuff. But, but, but he does it and he enjoys doing it and he, 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 that, 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 that's his thing. So um, he, um, he came across an old farmer from northwest of Bismarck and, and so uh, he asked his family, him, if he could uh, use his recollections of the 30s. And so this is his recollections and, and I bet uh, if there are really, you know, some 90-year-old people here in the audience that they could say the same thing. So 32 was a good year, 33 was a bad year, uh, 34 was dry with lots of dust, 35 was a good year with rains, I suppose everything's relative, and then 36 is a very bad year, the worst, lots of dust, grasshoppers, they had three loads of hay where normally they get 20 to 30, Dust black in the sky, they had to turn on oil lamps to see at noon. They sold all their livestock, kept only a dairy cow. If you had to use Russian thistle for forage, it got sick. There wasn't any wheat. 37 was better than 36 and still bad. So it was pretty much hell. It was just hell. And a lot of people, a lot of people left. I was just talking to a no-till support group in Fargo here a couple days ago, talking to a bunch of farmers. And the one farmer I was at, he, uh, he and his wife, um, keep track of abstracts, you know, they do abstract work for de sales of deeds and stuff. And they said some of these, some of these pieces of land back in the 30s, they would change hands like eight times in about two years, you know. People, you know, they'd sell it for nothing, they'd try to make it, they couldn't make it, and they sold it and sold it. So it was pretty awful. A lot of, a lot of farmland was deserted, uh, I'm sure, in this area too, uh, back in that time. So. Uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad did not advertise this in 1880 when they were trying to get people to move into this area, did they? I mean, they, the, the, the big pumpkins and the big ears of corn and all that kind of stuff, but they failed to mention that a wind, you know, a, a low wind day is 20 mile an hour, you know, so, so this is a big deal. So in the beginning of the 30s, the USDA finally figured out that we were in the high, one of some of the highest wind erosion areas in the country. So, yay. All right, so this is by Bismarck. This is in the late 30s. That's a fence built on top of a fence. And look at the guy's tie, and it's going like this. This is in uh, western uh, Minnesota. Uh, they didn't escape either until you got maybe about 100 miles into Minnesota, and then it's okay. But uh, they had the same problem. And look at that soil. I mean, it's just like flour. Any, any old wind at all. It just dust everywhere, every day, all the time. It's a dust storm by Williston. Uh, the uh, USDA kept hearing stories about how horrible it was. They sent a photographer out, Mr. Russell, and um, he took a series of photographs uh, in northwestern, in western North Dakota at, at that time. Here's a, a pasture during the dust storm in 37. Look at that great forage. Isn't that great forage? It's wonderful forage. Uh, and this is an aftermath of dust storm in western Minnesota uh, with all the ex soil in the ditch and covering the fences up halfway. This is my own personal photograph collection. It's here on South Dakota, 11.55 a.m., just before noon on November 12, 1933. Those are the street lights that are on. And you can just barely see that car. Middle of the day. These things lasted for days. 
And this is a, from up by Watertown. Uh, we, so we see pictures like this from Kansas and Texas and Oklahoma and kind of accept it. We, but there aren't that many pictures from up here, you know, because I think that <laughs> you, you get out of your house, you get out of your house and you try to collect what livestock didn't die. I mean, the last thing you're going to do is pick up a camera and take a picture of it, right? I mean, it was just, it was really horrible. And so, um, down there, bigger populations and uh, not as much risk of freezing to death. And, and so there were more pictures from Kansas and those kind of areas. But we had the same thing up here, black blizzards all the time, multiple times during the year. This is uh, one by Watertown as well. This is three o'clock in the afternoon on uh, May 4th, I think that's May, 4th, May 9th, 1934. May 7th, 1934, can't tell. Yeah, it's a nine. Doesn't matter. Anyway, same kind of thing as in Huron. This is like Gregory, South Dakota. We're not that far away from Gregory right now, but that's Gregory, South Dakota. And it says, one of South Dakota's black blizzards, 1934. It doesn't say the South Dakota black blizzard. See, so you see what's going on here? I mean, this is just awful. This is an aftermath of a dust storm down by Gregory. Uh, here's a, if you, if you, let me see, I think this is a still from Ken Burns uh, Dust Bowl uh, series uh, and, and I think, I think it's animated and this, this, this guy is just walking against the wind with all this dust blowing all through him. This is a hog building by Gr Gregory, South Dakota after one of those blizzards. So, you know, the, the farmers had livestock, they had no income, the soil had all blown away, it had been dry for a year or two, don't have any crop, they don't have any money, a lot of people have moved away, I mean, whole thousands of acres, you know. Um, southwest of Fargo is a fairly large area called uh, Cheyenne Grasslands. Uh, the town on the west side of it is McLeod, and, and I don't think Mick Kerr uh, was a TV personality in Fargo, and he has a radio show out of Lisbon. I don't know if he comes out this way or not. Anyway, he grew up in McLeod, and in, we talked one day, and he said that, that his, his dad would take him around the grasslands and said that, you know, Mr. Knudsen lived here, Mr. Smith lived here, Mr. This moved here. You know, every quarter section was, was populated during that time, and now it's just dunes. It's just dunes, and there's huge bluffs along the Cheyenne River that didn't used to be there. And he said if you dug down into those dunes, you'd find the trees that were there in the 30s when the, when, you know, the wind would stop it and the soil would just drop there. So the, the government had a program where you could send a cow in or a horse or anything. They would give you $10 for it and, and then they would shoot it and put it in the pit because it probably had dust ammonia anyway. It wasn't worth anything. So anyway, you get your you get some money to live on by, by putting your out livestock out there and having the government shoot it. One of the things I run up against all the time is that farmers think that their only problem is what they see in the ditch. Is that, you know, they had, they had a dust storm, they lost some soil, oh, it's just a pain, they got to go out and they got to grade it out of the ditch and put it in the field. And, and that is definitely not what's going on out there. What you see in a ditch is just a small portion of whatever was lost out there. So this is a clipping from the Bismarck Tribune um, around April 22nd or 23rd, 1934. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's talking about their latest dust storm that year. And, then, and they had a really severe one on April 21, 21 22, 1934. Uh, and, uh, says the latter storm caused the most comment because of the fact that the 22nd was a Sunday and travel both by automobile and by plane uh, was hazardous and difficult. And of course, that was the day that people would travel, you know, because they work all week and then they, if they're going to travel, they go to go someplace. Several avi aviators reported that dust was encountered at all levels up to 14,000 feet. You know, almost three miles. So we didn't have satellite photographs back then, but we didn't have aerial planes. So we had, so these things, no matter how small, how large they are, three-dimensional. You got the stuff that goes in the ditch, but then you got this aerial stuff that just goes for like a long way, a long way. 
So now we have satellites. That's the Palouse about a decade ago. And, and the, the plumes on those, the scale of that is over 100 miles. So the dust that came from these North Dakota, South Dakota, the whole regional storms blanketed cities in the east. In Chicago, they had to use you know, plows to clean off their streets. In New York, they had to use plows to clean off their streets. In Washington, D.C., the reason we had the Soil Conservation Service is that the guy that really tried to champion it had telegraph people across the country from Kansas to, to, to Washington, D.C. To, so he could time his presentation when the dust storm was going to hit D.C. And so he received word that it was going to hit in the next half hour. And so he gets up and he starts to talk and it hit and he motioned to the window and he says, gentlemen, that's Kansas blowing by. And they created the Soil Conservation Service. So these things traveled for a very, very, very long time out into the oceans. They can core them. You know, this is a couple thousand miles out from the Sahara. It just once it gets up in the air, it's 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 there. So this is the assessment of the USDA during the 30s, at least in North Dakota, that um, what, almost 600,000 acres with serious erosion. They could maybe fix it if they really worked hard at it, but 9.1 million acres were so severely eroded that further use for crop and livestock production is economically unfeasible, and, and that probably exists today. We have 40, 40 some million acres of possible land that could have been crop, maybe, and, uh, and quite a bit of it has ranged now, almost 20 million acres, and, and, and we have the Cheyenne grasslands, we have other grasslands that are just, you know, they're, they're, gazed, they're grazed with a very low livestock population, but um, we lost a lot of farm ground during that period of time. Whoa, what happened there? All right. So, uh, anyway, in 33, this is early on during that period, it is estimated that to topsoil losses reduced annual productivity 15 to 25 percent. And when soil was fully stripped, fields became barren. That's a memo to the Secretary of Agriculture in 1933. So, so we had all this, all this soil, and it was, it was just wonderful. And, and now it's you know, largely gone. It was the bank of thousands of years of soil, plant, and microorganism activity. In, I didn't look up any figures in, in South Dakota, but I, I, I challenge you to, to do that kind of thing. Um, uh, Minnesota State Moorhead has a, has a historian, Hiram Drockey, and um, he wrote a, he's wrote, written several books about the Red River Valley and, and that region, uh, and, uh, and so he, he found records where, where wheat yields uh, southwest of Fargo when they were first put in the ground with crappy planters, with only marginally adapted wheat varieties, were over 40 bushels an acre. You know, it, a lot of times we struggle to hit 40 to bushels an acre in some years, you know, and, and so here we are, you know, what, 140 years ago, and they were going 40 bushels an acre. We've come a long way, haven't we? That would only be possible if those soils were releasing over 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and the phosphate and everything else was, was sufficient. Uh, today, even on fairly high organic matter soils that people fallow it, you know, it's almost always less than 100 pounds of N per acre on fallow soils. So some enterprising researchers or scientists decided to pick up some of that stuff that was in Central Park in, North, in New York and uh, had it analyzed. And they had a general idea about where it came from. And so what they found is that, that the that soil there, the, the dust, had 19 times more phosphate than the dust was left, 10 times more organic matter, 9 times more nitrogen, and 40 times more potassium. So all the good stuff all the good stuff left. These are, these are wheat yields of Russia and North Dakota um, from 1880 up until 1990-something. Uh, we won't 
care about Russia much. Uh, but the the uh, white boxes on the top, those are those are North Dakota Cody yields, and it's in kilograms per hectare. And someday I'll redo this thing, but not not today. And but those are 25 to 30 bushel yields, you know, in, in 1880 to about 19. 15 something like that and then they started to drop even before it got dry it was they were going down into the 15 to 20s and they really didn't recover of course those really horrible yields were the really really dry years but it never really covered up to 1880 levels until people started putting on fertilizer in the 50s So these are my estimates, and I think they're very conservative estimates, but this is what I think we've had. And I'll show you some evidence about that in just a, a minute. But I estimate we lost about a foot of soil from the hilltops, about eight inches from the slopes, I average of six inches of topsoil in North Dakota from about 30 million acres of cropland. The total weight of that is 30 billion tons. Um, and soils, productive soils, almost always contain around a ton of P205 an acre. So that means that we would have lost during that period of time in the 30s about 150 years of phosphate application at our today's present rates. So we exported quite a little bit and got nothing back for it. So after the 30s, everything changed, right? No, no problems at all, you know, no erosion events. You know, that's not true, is it? Every time it's windy, we lose. So, you know, across the Great Plains, millions of acres and in the in the 50s, and in those periods in the 60s, in the 70s, and, and who, can rem who can forget those wonderful years of 88 and 89? You know, though that was a treat, wasn't it? And so uh, we've lost uh, lots and lots of topsoil back and bought that all during that period of time. And it was, you know, in the late 70s, probably, that, that a few people around here and in southwestern North Dakota and, and just scattered around and up in the Manitoba and Saskatchewan decided that if they weren't going to do something, their kids wouldn't have anything to farm at all. It's all going to be rangeland. And so, so they started doing that no-till thing. And, and at first, Extension really wasn't that excited about it. Uh, but seeing the success and working with them, they decided that, um, that this is a good idea after all. And so then the, the Manitoba North, Hill, North Dakota no-till conference came, came about, and now a lot of states have their own, like you do, uh, no-till, and, and you all can see the benefits of it. During that period of time after the 50s, uh, that's not snow up at North, in, in near Grand Fork County. There was still a lot of soil loss, as you know. Um, you know, in 77 alone, we had, uh, what, 13% of our cropland was damaged by wind. Uh, we lost about an inch of soil in 1980 from about 2.1. Um, you know, just all these years we've just lost. So, so I guess the question, and, and, and now that, you know, we have some tools that, that can do this, I mean, but you all, you all know farmers that aren't all that concerned about this, that, you know, this, they don't have any idea what's been lost or what they stand to lose. And so why, why aren't they concerned? And, and I think the reason is, is because they mask the effects of whatever erosion they have with tillage and they don't have any check plot. They don't have any check for reference. Or if they do, you know, they kind of ignore the obvious. One of the things that, that I see from time to time is, is these rock piles, is that, you know, these rock piles were started, I don't know, 50 years ago or 80 years ago. And a lot of them are on pedestals that the soil around it is eroded away and so the rock piles are kind of heaped up on top of it. So what happens is, let's, let's start out in, I don't know, 1900. Let's say broke up the field in 1900. You have a, a, the A horizon is the really black stuff and maybe you've got two feet of it. And then the B horizon is something where chemically changed. Maybe you've got some lime down there. Maybe there's a little bit more clay down there. The color is certainly different. The chemistry is a little bit different. It's been changed somehow by the prairie grasses and, and all that. And then the C horizon is whatever you have in the bottom of it. It hasn't been changed by biology at all. So you start to plow and you start to chisel and the wind starts to blow. And then for quite a while, you know, maybe 20, 30 years, something like that, 
you know, it's still, it's still pretty much as black as what it was when you first started the plow. And you don't see any difference. But then at some point in time, you've lost enough topsoil that you're actually working into the topsoil some of that bee horizon, some of that lower organic matter stuff. But the person looks behind them at what they've just done, and it just looks as black as it ever did. And every year, it still looks as black as it kind of ever did. And they're digging more and more and more into the bee and more and more in the bee. And, they, and so eventually it's really not the A anymore. It's just kind of a mixture of A and a little bit of A and a lot of B. And they get to the point where they're actually digging into the parent material that didn't have hardly any organic matter in it at all. And, and they look in the back of the tractor and it still looks black to them. But it's not. It's not nearly as black as what it did. So my colleague, uh, Dave Hopkins, and his graduate student at the time, they revisited some soil surveys. There were some soil survey benchmarks NRCS uh, made back in around 1960, roughly. And so they went back to those same locations, did transects, and identified where, where they'd worked before. And so in uh, western Walsh County, which is just northwest of Grand Forks, uh, there was a there was a site, um, all the sites that weren't in pasture were affected, but this one was the worst. In 1958, when they characterized this, they found that the sea horizon, the place where the parent material was, was 34.3 inches below the surface of the soil. When Dave went back and they re-dug the holes in 2014, uh, the distance between surface and sea horizon was 15 inches. During that period of time, they'd, they'd lost, what, 19 inches? 19 inches of topsoil uh, during that period of time, and the farmer had no idea. It still looked back to them. And so you saw a picture of this just the other day, you know, just the prior speaker. But when you see those kind of things, the dark layer over junk, that, that means that dark layer is not the original dark layer. That's, that's just whatever might have left over from the original topsoil mixed in with the subsoil. That's when you see a boundary like that, that's what that is. A little, little, little tease of a topsoil with the junk underneath. Sometimes you can look down in the soil if you grow a soil, if you do a soil pit, and um, next time you go see one, and, and you, you know, there'll be some here and there, field days and things. Um, you'll see a, an old uh, badger hole or an old ground squirrel hole or a root channel or something like that down at depth and it'll be filled with the original organic matter and if not the original organic matter, organic matter from long past. So you can look back in time and see what the organic matter used to look like. So this is kind of a topsoil roughly uh, that's been in CRP for a long time. We can see the old worm channel uh, in there and see how black that is compared to the soil on top of it. The black is what the soil used to look like and the gray around it is what the soil was made uh, through uh, tillage and erosion. So there's a lot of additional evidence for the topsoil loss, not just my estimates. So in Divide County, which is in northwest uh, North Dakota, you, can, you, can, you might be able to find your old county soil survey on the web. A lot of these have been scanned, and so you can kind of look this up if you're lucky enough to have a county that, that, that has this scan. Anyway, Divide County, 1900, a Divide Soil Series, and there's Divide Soil Series all the way down to almost to Lemon, South Dakota, uh, was described as having 16 inches of very black topsoil. And I've been on Divide Soils uh, within the past 20 years, and it has no black topsoil. It has a light gray topsoil, and, and they probably lost at least a foot of soil off those, and that's conservative. In Cass County, the one that uh, Fargo is in, uh, they describe a wheatland soil is uh, two foot of topsoil with organic matter 6.9%, and I've been on wheatland, so it's about, uh, what, 10 miles west of Castleton. It's a wheatland exit, north side of the road, but there's wheatland soils all through that area. And generally, they're about 2% organic matter uh, down to about 6 inches and then stuff down underneath that. And they've, they've lost it all. 
They've lost it all, at least two feet of topsoil they've lost off of that soil. They describe a man, Miami loam, which is probably a Bearden, as having three feet of 7% plus organic matter. And today, if you go on a Bearden almost any place, it's about six, six inches of 4%, probably lost two and a half feet of topsoil on that soil. And a Fargo soil is described as two feet of really black 7% plus organic matter. Today it's five, six inches, you know, around 5%. In Brookings County in South Dakota, 1903, a Marshall sandy loam soil is described as eight, eight inches of 6.7% organic matter soil. Uh, a Marshall loam, 12 inches of 5.8% and then two feet of 2.8% probably a Barnes or something like it described today, uh, which has a typical A horizon of three to four percent. So in these kind of soils, they probably lost one to two feet of their topsoil. So from the 30s to today, um, I estimate we've lost another six inches of topsoil from about 20 million acres of crop ground. Uh, that's an additional 12.5 million tons of P205, about 40 million tons of nitrogen. That's the equivalent of 75 pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus application at today's present rate. It's about two generations of fertilizer inputs. And, it, and in areas, it still hasn't stopped. I mean, every time it's dry in the spring, when the ground's bare and the wind blows more than 20 miles an hour, the soil starts to move. You see these clouds everywhere. That's an aftermath of a storm um, in the Red River Valley. And people try to rough up the ground, but then it smooths over and, you know, I don't know, I think, you know, I, I think as long as they think they're busy, they're doing something nice. <laughs> this is a dust storm at Craven Corner, South Dakota, Wester Aberdeen in 2017. So any any time you have any time that you have work ground and it's a little bit dry in the spring and starting to dry out and then you get one of those fronts come through, um, you you lose more soil. All right, so you know people call it snert, but it's not funny. Um, so we're not the 30s, you know. We're not even the 50s, you know. We we have there's there's any number of different tools that a person can 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 put on their machines so you can plant through about anything. You can plant through stalks, you can plant through wheat residue, and you know, you have to manage the whole kind of system, but there's really no excuse not to do it anymore. There is a conservation tillage, but you can see the dust in the, in the end, and certainly it's not as, as horrible as, as if they'd plowed it and then worked it clean, but, you know, it's just de delaying the inevitable. That the NRCS has what I hate, what I hate in their, in their surveys, is they have the tolerable soil loss. I, I, I can't think of any tolerable soil loss. You know, why is that tolerable? And they, they say it thinking that the soil is going to build itself up. But unless there's some change, it'll never build itself up. You'll always lose that little bit. It's not tolerable at all. So whoever's in charge, you know, let them know, okay? I don't think that's a good idea. So the answer to it is, as the previous speaker had, you know, make sure that something's on the ground all the time. You know, you need the mulch, they especially need the mulch down in Kansas where the evapotranspiration in the summertime is just abominable. <coughs> And they think they have winter, but they really don't, you know, but <laughs> they, so, you know, there's just a lot of evapotranspiration that happens almost 12 months a year, and so they need that mulch. And, and some, some, you're kind of a little bit in that area here. I mean, you're not quite as hot, but it can get dang hot here, too. And, um, and uh, you know, your season is shorter, yeah, but... You know, even yesterday, it was, what, 37 or something like that outside? I thought I was in the tropics. I looked for mangoes. So, you know, so, so having that mulch there for the temperature is, is a very good thing uh, during, the, during the growing season. Depending on the crops you grow, though, you also have to think about how, 
how the soil is going to warm up in the springtime. So the thing, things that are fairly cool season crops like, like uh, wheat and I don't know, there might be a scattering of canola around here, uh, barley, some other uh, cool season crops. Uh, they don't really care if, it's, if there's mulch everywhere. But you start getting into, say, corn for real and not just a forage, then you, know, you need the soil to warm up a little bit. And, that, and that's where something like strip till uh, would come in, some strip till down uh, in southeastern North Dakota. Um, and, uh, and it still has the same, same nice no-till properties. It still acts like a no-till field, but, but it has that little bare strip in the middle where, where it warms up, dries up, and, and so you can make as much corn as, as um, non-erodible uh, conventional till, if there is such a thing. Uh, and build your soil up over time. Uh, the farmer that, that has this is, has raised his organic matter over 40 some years from what his neighbors were around 3, 3.2, something like percent. Um, that particular field is like 7.2 percent. It's almost approaching prairie levels. So he does cover crops, he does uh, strip till, uh, he no tills his weed into that, he has a multi year rotation. So you know, there's, there's, there's no excuse that a person could tell me uh, that there is no workaround to make a no-till or strip-till work. And that's the only way that you're going to stop the soil from eroding, and that's the only way to get on the other side of it and start to build your soil up so you're actually going to get some benefit out of this. One of the things we see, uh, in, and the previous speaker alluded to it, we're the only state that has this, but I think others, when they get serious about it uh, and have turnover of you know, people retire and, and have new people come in and seriously look at it. When I first, when I first came to North Dakota, the No-Till Association, they invited me out to talk in Minot. And so, um, coldest night I've ever been in North Dakota was minus 45 degrees the next morning, no wind chill. Uh, but I also remember it because they invited me to the smoker uh, that was on, uh, in the Holiday Inn, and uh, we got the chance to meet all the, a lot of the original people, the Beach Boys and Joe Brecker and other people. So they were happy to see me, but they also said that they didn't follow NDSU fertilizer recommendations anymore, and I was surprised and asked them why, and they said after they'd been in no-till for a number of years, they found that they could start shaving their nitrogen rates back. And they'd shaved them off enough that they didn't even pay attention to what our recommendations were. So I said, okay. And I remembered that. And in 2010, I think, when I put all my wheat, wheat together, I remembered the conversation and I divided it up between, between uh, long-term no-till fields, which I define as six years or more continuous no-till, not hobby no-till, six years continuous serious no-till, and, and um, conventional till. And they were right that the credits were like 50 pounds of N less use on wheat. And, and so when I, when I did my corn work to reinvestigate those recommendations, my sunflower work, I, I specifically looked at fields that were conventional and no-till. And, and I found similar credits with both those crops. So, and one of the things we found lately is that long-term no-till crops, long-term no-till soils have a lot higher um, asymbiotic nitrogen fixing organism bacteria activity than conventional till neighbors right across the fence of the road. So that, that's part of that credit. That's where part of it comes from, is the activity of these, of these asymbiotic things that aren't living on the root, like a rhizobium oil. They're just out there. I mean, they're, they're in all of our soils. It's just that we destroy their food. Or, I mean, we, we destroy their housing, and we limit their food so that it's just kind of a background level. You know, they're just barely surviving out there. But once we have stable housing and a multiple food, as you saw from the you know, nematodes and little things and big things and intermediate things and all these things are, are dying and pooping and sliming and all kinds of stuff going on all, all over the place, that that these things can survive. And so that's where some of the credit comes from. So people that are in these systems that can be more conservative on their fertilizer and still have hellish high yields. I mean, this guy in southeast North Dakota, we pulled 250 bushel corn off his field last year. I mean, it's 70, 80 bushel beans, you know. So you don't have to be poor to be 
no-till. All right, so despite the historic high rates of fertilizer nutrients levels of phosphate on many North Dakota and South Dakota fields, I know that they are still very low because we lost all of our native stuff. I mean, it's almost all gone. You know, it's all gone. And so we, we have to make it up somehow. Uh, so we have at least about 200 years of no soil loss and continued phosphate application to catch up where we were in 1890, and that should be pretty sobering if it's not. Some of you that are in the, in the retail business, or, or maybe you've had these thoughts yourself, why don't my soil phosphate levels improve? You know, I'm putting on more than I ever have. You know, I'm, I'm conventional till, and you know, I, I still, they just they never build up. Well, it's because you lose them every spring. Well, why is my soil pH increasing? You know, it's because a lot of these subsoils have high pH in the subsoil, and guess what? Now you're farming the subsoil. You don't have anything to do there, anything else you're doing except tilling it. And then why do I have more soil crusting? Because your organic matter is so desperately low that there's nothing to keep it from crusting. All right, so the only remedy for continued soil degradation is no-till or modified no-till such as strip-till. So we've had a long history of phosphate export, first on purpose with the buffalo bones and then second as an <coughs> unintended consequence of doing what people at the time thought was right. Soil fertility is intimately related to soil conservation. There's definitely a tie between them. And the only way to restore it is through long-term no-till commitment. Thank you. <laughs>